in the previous segment, we developed the basic model for selection on a quantitative trait in the context of the breeder's equation, which was motivated by the practice of artificial selection in an agricultural context. In this segment, we'll um, modify this scheme slightly um, to fit more um, conveniently the way selection actually works in nature. But whether in nature or um, in the lab or in a plant breeding institute or wherever, selection is happening if there is any sort of non-random relationship between phenotypes um, that could include performances of various kinds and fitnesses. But that selection will cause evolution only if there is also heritable, that is to say, additive variation for the phenotypes under selection. The rate of evolutionary change will then depend on the strength of the selection, that is, how very non-random is the relationship between phenotypes and fitnesses, and on the amount of additive genetic variation. For directional selection, which we'll um, confine ourselves to for now, in the next lecture, we'll look at um, schemes of selection that may be other than directional. Um, there are these two equivalent ways to represent this relationship. And the big idea here in this segment is that they are, in fact, completely equivalent. Um, each is just more naturally suited to thinking about a different context. So here's the breeder's equation that we saw last time. The response to selection that we expect to get um, measured as the change in the mean trait value will be equal to the heritability, little h squared, times, there it is, little h squared, times the selection differential. And remember, the narrow sense heritability is the additive genetic variance as a fraction of the total phenotypic variance, VA over VP, then times S, um, the selection differential. This new scheme, the uh, selection gradient equation, we can call it, um, represents R typically as delta X or delta X bar, meaning the movement of the mean, the change in the mean, which is the same thing as R. But now the right-hand side looks a little different. It's written as V sub A, the additive variance itself, times beta. And this thing beta takes some development. Um, it is, um, as we'll see, the relationship between relative fitness and trait values. And it turns out that it is um, mathematically equivalent to the selection differential over the phenotypic variance itself, right? Big S over V sub P. And that, um, if you believe what I've just written down here, shows that these two things are equivalent because it's the same three terms um, in the same relations, just um, bracketed slightly differently. But it's the same thing um, algebraically um, in either case. You, that the equivalence won't be obvious to you yet, um, but it will make more sense when we see what the selection gradients actually look like. And we'll develop this idea with our old friends, um, the Darwin's finches um, and their beak depths. Um, they are, of course, a classic example of very rapid um, ecological time evolution of a quantitative trait. Um, Remember, we've been through this before, the beak and body sizes of Darwin's medium ground finches on Isla Daphne Mayor in the Galapagos um, shot up um, in 1977 in response to a terrible drought brought on by a major El Nino event in the Pacific. And it caused um, beak sizes in this upper graph and body sizes, which track them very closely, um, to go up. Uh, very strongly in a two-year interval between 1976, just before the drought, and then 1978, the first year um, after the drought that the birds were able to reproduce. 
Um, it was classic ecological adaptation to a trade-off. Um, the, remember the birds, um, larger birds with larger beaks, um, were able to handle the um, larger, harder seeds that remained available after all the favored seeds of this species, which were small and soft, had been eaten up. And since the plants weren't making any more because it was so horribly dry, um, they were in uh, real difficulty. And so they had to turn to the to other species seeds, and that's what strongly favored bigger birds with bigger beets. After um, the normal weather came back, uh, over a period of a couple of decades, um, beak and body sizes did gradually relax back to something more like the range they'd been in uh, when the grants first showed up on the island and started studying the birds. And of course this happened, as we saw before, um, by sort of classic selection by survival. Um, the, um, in 1976, before the drought, here's the distribution of beak depths um, with a mean slightly below uh, nine and a half millimeters in a huge sample, 750 birds um, that were banded and measured by the grants and their students. Um, two years later, um, there was um, a much smaller population of birds. Um, this data set has only 90 uh, measured birds in it, um, and their uh, mean beak size is significantly larger, a little over 10 millimeters mean beak depth. But it's important to emphasize that here, as in pretty much any other um, uh, selective regime in nature, there's no sharp cutoff. There's no alpha above which you survive and or reproduce and below which um, you don't survive or don't pr reproduce. Um, it will be um, a continuous relationship between, in this case, body size and beak size and the probability of survival. But there were many small-bodied, small-beaked individuals who did survive and reproduce um, in 1978, and here are some of them down here in the lower tail of the survivor's distribution, almost as small as the smallest birds present um, on the island in 1976. So what had happened is the distribution was just shifted upward, so relatively more of it consisted of these birds with uh, beak sizes above 10 millimeters or so. So in this kind of situation, the selection gradient provides the natural way to think about and actually quantify the continuous relationship between phenotypic states and fitnesses. And we're going to develop this by applying it in a sort of um, kooky artificial way to Heron and Freeman's um, invented um, selection experiment on uh, tail length in mice. We've already been through this in the previous segment. Here it is again with um, a, as a histogram of the parental mice. Um, the pink ones are those that were selected um, for breeding. They had tails above nine and a half centimeters or so, and the ones who didn't get to breed who had tails below that cutoff. Uh, it turns out the selection differential was about um, 0.6 uh, centimeters, about six millimeters of tail length, that is. Um, and the heritability um, ended up uh, being a little less than 0.6 also. And so here's the, the um, formalism we developed in the previous um, part of this lecture uh, for this artificial selection context. But here it is, and um, Heron and Freeman, uh, to their great credit, uh, did this themselves. Um, they've forced this onto the selection gradient um, type um, scheme by um, graphing and estimating the selection gradient, beta, um, which is the slope of the regression line that describes the relationship between fitness, um, relative fitness on the y-axis, and values of the phenotype x. So it's just the regression between the phenotype and fitness when the mean fitness 
is normalized to one. Okay, that is to say, we adjust the units of fitness so that the mean of the population as a whole, including those who didn't reproduce, um, is normalized to one. So the mean is one, but in fact, in this experiment, no one had a fitness of one. The parents who were selected for breeding, it turns out, had a fitness of three on this scale of relative fitness, and all those who um, didn't get to reproduce had a fitness of zero, of course, which makes obvious sense. So why three? That's because the mean fitness of all the eligible parental mice is one when you assign a, a fitness of three to the one-third of the parent's population that got to reproduce, right? There were 10 of them. There were 20 that didn't get to breed. So when a third of the parents have a fitness of three, the mean is one, okay? And given that all the others have a fitness of zero. That's where the three comes from. So when you do that and then shoot a regression through those points, which no one can stop you from doing, um, then um, you get a slope of 2.06, and you can stick that in um, all the other algebra and get out all the same results that we got this way by using the breeder's equation. And we'll have a, a, a quiz question in, that invites you to do a little bit of that. You just have to know that the total phenotypic variation, that is the phenotypic variance, is point, um, to nine, a little less than 0.3 um, centimeters squared, um, and then um, it, it all works out. Okay, so that's the selection gradient idea illustrated with this made-up example of an artificial selection experiment. Um, it's so unusual, this little mouse who didn't get to breed, who I assume must be a thoughtful female mouse, says, oh, okay, finally I get it. The evolutionary response to selection is proportional to the additive genetic variance, which is the point. Notice delta x, or delta x bar, is the additive variance times beta, where beta is this relationship between phenotypes and fitnesses, with fitnesses normalized to have a mean of one. So it sort of made her day to get that, and she's probably the first mouse in all of recorded history to ever understand this deep principle of quantitative trait evolution. All right, here's an application to real nature. Um, it's about bumblebees selecting on flower size in a plant called the Alpine Sky Pilot, which was studied for many years by Candace Galen, who was, I believe, at the University of Colorado, uh, working nearby in the Colorado Rockies on this gorgeous flower, the Alpine Sky Pilot, Polamonium viscosum, which grows um, at uh, above tree line at, in high tundra um, on this place called Pennsylvania Mountain in the Rockies. And Candace, walking around, noticed that flowers up there were to her eye, obviously bigger than those on plants growing at a lower elevation, just downslope a ways at Timberline, where the trees gave way uh, to this treeless um, alpine sort of habitat. And she wondered, why would that be? Why would the same plants growing, you know, not that far away, just at a higher elevation, have bigger flowers? Well, she then noticed that at Timberline, the uh, plants were pollinated by a large variety of flying insects, including flies, diptera, small solitary bees, and bumblebees, like this one down here. But higher up at the tundra sites, the only pollinators she ever saw were the bumblebees. So the little insects didn't go up there. I guess it was too unrewarding, too windy, too exposed. For some reason, they didn't like it up there wouldn't go there. And so the plants up there got pollinated by bumblebees. Why would that make them have bigger flowers? Well, she thought it looks like maybe 
the plants with larger flowers attract more bumblebees, and flowers that attract more bees will set more seeds. Okay, nice hypothesis. So um, if that were true, it would suggest the tundra populations evolved larger flowers because the bumblebees, which up at these high elevation sites, remember the bumblebees are the only pollinators, so if they prefer large flowers, um, it will pay an individual plant to make bigger flowers um, so as to attract more of the bees, because if you don't, you won't set as many seeds. So she thought, how do I test my hypothesis to make it science? Well, um, one of the assumptions it, that hypothesis makes is that flower size is heritable. That is to say that the size, the visual diameter of the flowers, which is called corolla flare, apparently if you're a botanist, um, the corolla flare trait um, and needs to have heritable variation if it's going to evolve, so I'd better test whether that's true. And then I'd better test um, whether it's true, really, that larger bees um, go more often to the bigger flowers, which I think is true based on my observations up there. But the key point is, do they set more seeds? Um, and so she then did a really heroic experiment, caging a large number of plants with a bunch of bumblebees, getting them, letting the bees do the pollination, allowing the plants to set seeds, germinating the seeds, then planting the seedlings out at random in a uh, garden that uh, represents the natural habitat. Okay, and then six years later, when the plants had had a chance um, to be big enough um, and, and being adult, they're, they're long-lived perennials, and so she then counted the survivors for her measure of um, fitness. All right, so that's the experiment. What did she find? Well, the first um, assumption turned out to be true. Corolla flare was heritable and had a fairly substantial heritability around 0.5. So that meant there was some additive variance. How much? Well, um, the phenotypic variance of Corolla flare between plants turned out to be around five and a half. Uh, that would be uh, centimeters squared. No, millimeters squared. These are little flowers. Corolla flare is measured in millimeters on this graph. Um, and half of that would be 2.83 millimeters squared of additive genetic variance. All right, then um, did fitness depend on Corolla flare? of the plant? And the answer was, yes, it did. Um, here's the data from which the selection gradient was estimated. It shows corolla flare, average corolla flare of the plant on the x-axis, which varied a lot from a minimum of what, about nine uh, millimeters to a maximum of about 19. And um, here's the um, regression line um, through all these points with the y-axis set um, to a measure of the relative fitness of each of the plants. We won't go into how she estimated um, the raw fitness, but the key point again is that um, those measures were normalized so that the mean over the whole population was one, and that's all these positive fitnesses um, set off against these many zero fitnesses, that is, plants that actually uh, didn't have any survivors. Okay, um, so from this she could then fit the entire um, equation and um, find that the predicted per generation change in mean flower size, given this estimate of heritability and given the demonstrated um, preference of the bumblebees for the larger flowered plants um, would have been um, close to um, four tenths of a millimeter per generation. Right, that's 0.13 um, beta, which is the average relative fitness increase per millimeter of increased 
Corolla flare. That's the meaning of the slope of this line, right? Corolla flare in millimeters on the x-axis, relative fitness, relative to a mean of one on the y-axis. Okay, so um, how fast would that be? Well, it's in fact over two and a half percent increase of the mean flower size per generation. So a 12%-ish difference between the tundra population and the tree line population could conceivably have evolved in as little as five generations if this experiment reasonably reflects what would have happened in nature. So in any event, um, way more than enough um, uh, natural selection power um, to move the flower size of this plant um, in a neighboring population as far as it was observed to differ from what was presumably the parent population um, in just a very short time, um, a blink of the eye in evolutionary time. Okay, so um, there we have it, selection in nature. Uh, that ends this lecture, and we'll pick up next time with the third and final part of the quantitative trait piece um, whenever you come back.